That's no moon. Hello, I'm Mike Levin, SEO. I gave you a little t preview of some of the t-shirts I just received and will be using in future Coding with Mike Fridays. Perhaps I'll make it so that I never repeat a t-shirt, but they have to be sufficiently cool. So if you ever plan on sending me anything, make sure you've watched past videos and understand my tastes in t-shirts. Anyway, when last we left off, we had made this project, Pipulate, support the providing of a bookmarklet, like such, so that if you go to a full window and brought up another instance of a uh, browser, let me do it as me, opened it out like so, and visited just any old site. Let's say BuzzFeed. And you click that bookmarklet, what you get is this web page not available. Uh, yes, because it's not local anymore. Uh, when I'm working at my home office, office, or home, I should say, it really is an office, it's just near my home, I am not on, uh, wait, no, I am on that. It auto-detected my host, that is correct. Is it not running anymore? Hey, are you running? I think it is. Let me check this one. Yep, definitely web page is not available. Hmm. <laughs> Oh, yep, looks like we lost connection. I'm sure that's a uh, locked up screen. So I pause. That was a strange momentary loss of internet that broke all my SSH connections. So I go back to the one where I was last running it. Okay, in this tab it was Python Pipulate. Oh, I got a CD into it. Whoops, pythonpipulate.py, pythonpipulate.py. Yes, this project will someday become popular if my videos can cease to ramble, but you'll see me deal even with the mistakes. And the waits for loads to occur, for servers to be ready. And likewise, let me repeat my demonstration. When you visit a site like BuzzFeed and you click the book, the Pipulate bookmarklet, it brings it all up, pre-filled in, and if that happened to be a Google spreadsheet with question mark replacement set up, it would get the question marks replaced. Let me demonstrate that. I pause for a moment. So say for example you were in Google Spreadsheets, and it was set up for question mark replacement to execute the uh, some function you wrote, name that in the system, with input parameters named this in the system. And you clicked the pipulate bookmarklet, which is here with this particular account. It's all set up, see that? Now the redraw stuff is a little weird, that bothers me. Maybe there's something in modal behavior that I need to investigate. But at any rate, I click Pipulate, I go to here, I do a redraw, and you should hopefully see those question marks replaced. I suppose I can do it. Pipulation is going to probably be something that has a process like, like this involved, perhaps. If you're working on things over and over, doing frequent uh, lookups, I'm going to have to figure out how to spare users the grief of rearranging windows like this. Uh, windows can be picked up and moved, I'm pretty sure, in uh, JavaScript. Um, so I can uh, open them in the first place in the right size, and then I can attempt to resize the parent window. We'll see. Uh, some things have yet to be uh, still proven out, but less every day. 
This system is becoming more solid and more ready for prime time every day. But there is a last giant remaining uh, elephant in the room that nobody's talking about. But here I'm going to start talking about its authentication. I cannot make this such that this pop-out window really needs your username or password, or else I'm going to have to go into S mode, uh, which adds certain complications, and I'll never have a correct security certificate installed, and everyone will encounter warnings. So instead of ever asking anyone for a real username and password, and like pickling it onto the hard drive, and then there's issues of, is this for, is this server intended to service one user with that account? Or now do I have to suddenly keep track of usernames and passwords for everyone who uses a server? Well, all this gets solved if I just don't do username and password and switch instead to something called OAuth2 authentication. In which case, there is an implementation, and this is where uh, I spent the last week researching OAuth2. There is something called implicit um, grants, which don't require the client secret, which I had previously been calling the application secret, but I now know to be called in the official documentation the client secret, which identifies applications and proves they are what they are for three-legged authentication where the security token resides nowhere but the server uh, hosting the app and not on the web browser, which is also a client, which is why this language is bad. But the security token that gives access never touches the user's web browser. They only ever see a code and it gets exchanged for an authentication token. And for the duration of that session on the server, the server is caching the authentication token and all the user is doing is proving that they are who they say they are with the code. So it's, if the code slips out into the public, it doesn't necessarily give authentication to the holder of the code. Unlike using the authentication token in the browser, which could potentially allow a man in the middle attack to grab down the access token and have all the same access as uh, the original logged in person. You're subjecting yourself to session hijacking, but <clears throat> in the case of a free and open source project being released in GitHub, I can't put a client secret in code. I can't require you, the user of this application who's trying to use it from GitHub, to go get a client secret of your own and put in into the code, and I can't expect the users who just want to do question mark replacement to plug in a username and password. So there is a form of OAuth2, an authentication type or a scenario uh, or a granting scheme called implicit, which doesn't require um, the client secret uh, anywhere in the picture. And the price of that is the authentication token being transmitted out to the web browser as the uh, response redirect URL, thereby exposing enough access in an unencrypted format, because it's on a URL request, to everyone on the internet in those local networks along the way as it hops from router to router and switches from network to network. Anyone on the same network segment running a packet sniffer could hijack the session. So if you're using free Wi-Fi, for example, someone could hijack your session. If you are pipulating from a <clears throat> unencrypted open network, it's a very common hijacking technique. Um, but it is the least of all evils. I can't embed real user and names and passwords. I can't embed the client secret. I can't expect the uh, the, the coder out there using my project to pull these same, uh, you know, <clears throat> tricks as me to put the authentication outside the folder, there'd be, be all these passwords. So instead, I'm using OAuth2 
in implicit grant mode, and that's what my coding project is going to be about today. And I'm sure I bored you to tears by this time, but that is exposition. Thanks for joining me. Don't forget to subscribe. See you soon.